Chapter One of the Amateur Immigrant by Robert Louis Stevenson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. The Amateur Immigrant by Robert Louis Stevenson. Chapter One: The Second Cabin. I first encountered my fellow passengers on the Bromelaw in Glasgow. Thence we descended the Clyde in no familiar spirit, but looking askance on each other as on possible enemies. A few Scandinavians, who had already grown acquainted on the North Sea, were friendly and voluble over their long pipes, but amongst English speakers distance and suspicion reigned supreme. The sun was soon overclouded. The wind freshened and grew sharp as we continued to descend the widening estuary and with the falling temperature the gloom amongst the passengers increased. Two of the women wept. Any one who had come aboard might have supposed we were all absconding from the law. There was scarce a word interchanged, and no common sentiment but that of cold united us, until, at length, having touched at Greenwich, a pointing arm and a rush to the starboard now announced that our ocean steamer was in sight. There she lay in mid-river, at the tail of the bank, her sea-signal flying, a wall of bulwark, a street of white deck-houses, an aspiring forest of spars larger than a church, and soon to be as populous as many an incorporated town in the land to which she was to bear us. I was not in truth a steerage passenger. Although anxious to see the worst of immigrant life, I had some work to finish on the voyage and was advised to go by the second cabin, where at least I should have a table at command. The advice was excellent, but to understand the choice and what I gained, some outline of the internal disposition of the ship would first be necessary. In her very nose is steerage number one, down two pairs of stairs. A little abaft another companion, labelled steerage number two and three, gives admission to three galleries, two running forward towards steerage number one, and the third aft toward the engines. The starboard forward gallery is the second cabin. Away above the engines and below the officers' cabins, to complete our survey of the vessel, there is yet a third nest of steerages labelled four and five. The second cabin to return is thus a modified oasis in the very heart of the steerages. Through the thin partition you can hear the steerage passengers being sick, the rattle of tin dishes as they sit at meals, the varied accents in which they converse, the crying of their children terrified by this new experience, or the clean flat smack of the parental hand in chastisement. There are, however, many advantages for the inhabitant of this strip. He does not require to bring his own bedding or dishes but finds berths and a table completely if somewhat roughly furnished. He enjoys a distinct superiority in diet. But this, strange to say, differs not only on different ships, but on the same ship according as her head is to the east or west. In my own experience, the principal difference between our table and that of true steerage passenger was the table itself, and the crockery plates from which we ate. But lest I should show myself ungrateful, let me recapitulate every advantage. At breakfast we had a choice between tea and coffee for beverage. A choice not easy to make, the two were so surprisingly alike. I found that I could sleep after the coffee and lay awake after the tea, which is proof conclusive of some chemical disparity. And even by the palate I could distinguish a smack of snuff in the former from a flavour of boiling and dishcloths in the second. As a matter of fact, I have seen passengers, after many sips, still doubting which had been supplied to them. In the way of eatables at the same meal, we were gloriously favoured. For, in addition to porridge, which was common to all, we had Irish stew, sometimes a bit of fish, and sometimes rissoles. The dinner of soup, roast beef, boiled salt junk, and potatoes was, I believe, exactly common to the steerage in the second cabin. Only I have heard it rumoured that our potatoes were of a superior brand, and twice a week on pudding days, instead of duff, 
we had a saddle-bag filled with currants under the name of a plum pudding. At tea we were served with some broken meat from the saloon, sometimes in the comparatively elegant form of spare patties or rissoles, but, as a general thing, mere chicken bones and flakes of fish, neither hot or cold. If these were not the scrapings of plates, their looks belied them sorely. Yet we were all too hungry to be proud, and fell to these leavings greedily. These, the bread which was excellent, and the soup and porridge which were both good, formed my whole diet throughout the voyage, so that except for the broken meat and the convenience of a table, I might just as well have been in the steerage outright. Had they given me porridge again in the evening, I should have been perfectly contented with the fare. As it was, with a few biscuits and some whisky and water before turning in, I kept my body going and my spirits up to the mark. The last particular in which the second cabin passenger remarkably stands ahead of his brother of the steerage is one altogether of sentiment. In the steerage there are males and females. In the second cabin, ladies and gentlemen. For some time after I came aboard, I thought I was only a male. But in the course of a voyage of discovery between decks, I came upon a brass plate and learnt that I was still a gentleman. Nobody knew it, of course. I was lost in the crowd of males and females, and rigorously confined to the same quarter of the deck. Who could tell whether I housed on the port or starboard side of steerage, number two and three? And it was only there that my superiority became practical. Everywhere else I was incognito, moving among my inferiors with simplicity, not so much as a swagger to indicate that I was a gentleman after all, and had broken meat to tea. Still I was like one with a patent of nobility in a drawer at home and when I felt out of spirits, I could go down and refresh myself with a look of that brass plate. For all these advantages I paid but two guineas. Six guineas is the steerage fare, eight that by the second cabin. And when you remember that the steerage passenger must supply bedding and dishes, and in five cases out of ten, either brings some dainties with him, or privately pays the steward for extra rations, the difference in price becomes almost nominal. Air comparatively fit to breathe, food comparatively varied, and the satisfaction of being still privately a gentleman, may thus be had almost for the asking. Two of my fellow passengers in the second cabin had already made the passage by the cheap affair, and declared it was an experiment not to be repeated. As I go on to tell about my steerage friends, the reader will perceive that they were not alone in their opinion. Out of ten with whom I was more or less intimate, I am sure not fewer than five vowed if they returned to travel second cabin, and all who had left their wives behind assured me they would go without the comfort of their presence until they could afford to bring them by saloon. Our party in the second cabin was not perhaps the most interesting on board. Perhaps even in the saloon there was as much good will and character. Yet it had some elements of curiosity. There was a mixed group of Swedes, Danes and Norsemen, one of whom, generally known by the name as Johnny, in spite of his own protests, greatly diverted us by his clever cross-country efforts to speak English, and became, on the strength of that, a universal favourite. It takes so little in this world of shipboard to create a popularity. There was, besides, a Scots mason known from his favourite dish as Irish stew, three or four nondescript Scots, a fine young Irishman, O'Reilly, and a pair of young men who deserve a special word of condemnation. One of them was Scots, the other claimed to be American, admitted after some fencing that he was born in England, and ultimately proved to be an Irishman born and nurtured, but ashamed to own his country. He had a sister on board, whom he faithfully neglected throughout the voyage, although she was not only sick, but much his senior, and had nursed and cared for him in childhood. In appearance he was like an imbecile Henry the Third of France. The Scotsman, though perhaps as big an ass, was not so dead of heart, and I have only bracketed them together, because they were fast friends, 
and disgraced themselves equally by their conduct at the table. Next, to turn to topics more agreeable, we had a newly married couple, devoted to each other, with a pleasant story of how they had first seen each other years ago at a preparatory school, and that very afternoon he had carried her books home for her. I do not know if this story will be plain to southern readers, but to me it recalls many a school idol, with wrathful swains of eight and nine confronting each other's stride legs, flushed with jealousy, for to carry home a young lady's books was both a delicate attention and a privilege. Then there was an old lady, or oh, indeed I am not so sure she was as much old as antiquated and strangely out of place, who had left her husband and was travelling all the way to Kansas by herself. We had to take her own word that she was married, for it was sorely contradicted by the testimony of her appearance. Nature seemed to have sanctified her for the single state. Even the colour of her hair was incompatible with matrimony. And her husband, I thought, should be a man of saintly spirit and phantasmal bodily presence. She was ill, poor thing. Her soul turned from the viands. The dirty tablecloth shocked her like an impropriety, and the whole strength of her endeavour was spent upon keeping her watch true to Glasgow time till she should reach New York. They had heard reports, her husband and she, of some unwarrantable disparity of hours between these two cities, and with a spirit commendably scientific, had seized on this occasion to put them to the proof. It was a good thing for the old lady, for she passed much leisure time in studying the watch. Once, when prostrated by sickness, she let it run down. It was inscribed on her harmless mind in letters of adamant, that the hands of the watch must never be turned backwards, and so it behoved her to lie in wait for the exact moment as she started it again. When she imagined this was about due, she sought out one of the young second cabin Scotsmen, who was embarked on the same experiment as herself, and had hitherto been less neglectful. She was in quest of two o'clock, and when she learnt it was already seven on the shores of Clyde, she lifted up her voice and cried, Gravy! I had not heard this innocent expletive since I was a young child, and I suppose it must be the same for other Scotsmen presents, for we all laughed our fill. Last but not least I come to my excellent friend Mr. Jones. It would be difficult to say whether I was his right-hand man or he mine during the voyage. Thus at table I carved while he only scooped gravy, but at our concerts, of which more anon, he was the president who called up the performers to sing, and I but his messenger who ran his errands and pleaded privately with the over-modest. I knew I liked Mr. Jones from the moment I saw him. I thought him by his face to be Scottish, nor could his accent undeceive me. For as there is a lingua franca of many tongues on the moles and in the feluccas of the Mediterranean, so there is a free or common accent amongst English-speaking men who follow the sea. They catch a twang in a New England port, from a cockney skipper, even a Scotsman sometimes learns to drop an H. A word of dialect is picked up from another hand in the forecastle, until often the result is undecipherable, and you have to ask for the man's place of birth. So it was with Mr. Jones. I thought him a Scotsman who had been long to sea, and yet he was from Wales, and had been most of his life a blacksmith at an inland forge. A few years in America, and half a score of ocean voyages, having sufficed to modify his speech into the common pattern. By his own account he was both strong and skilful in his trade. A few years back he had been married, and after a fashion, a rich man. Now his wife was dead, and the money gone. But his was the nature that looks forward, and goes on from one year to another, and through all the extremities of fortune undismayed. And if the sky were to fall to-morrow, I should look to see Jones, the day following, perched on the step-ladder, and getting things to rights. He was always hovering round inventions like a bee over a flower, and lived in a dream of patents. He had with him a patent medicine, for instance, the composition of which he had bought years ago for five dollars from an American peddler, 
and sold the other days for a hundred pounds, I think it was, to an English apothecary. It was called Golden Oil, cured all maladies without exception, and I am bound to say I partook of it myself with good results. It is a character of the man that he was not only perpetually dosing himself with golden oil, but whether there was a head aching or a finger cut, there would be Jones with his bottle. If he had one taste more strongly than another, it was to study character. Many an hour have we two walked upon the deck, dissecting our neighbours in a spirit that was too purely scientific to be called unkind. Whenever a quaint or human tray stripped out in conversation, you might have seen Jones and me exchanging glances, and we could hardly go to bed in comfort till we had exchanged notes and discussed the day's experience. We were then like a couple of anglers comparing a day's kill. But the fish we angled for were of a metaphysical species, and we angled as often as not in one another's baskets. Once, in the midst of a serious talk, each found there was a scrutinising eye upon himself. I own I paused in embarrassment at this double detection, but Jones, with a better civility, broke into a peal of unaffected laughter, and declared what was the truth, that there was a pair of us indeed. End of chapter 1